Herbert West, Reanimator. Three. Six shots by midnight. It is uncommon to fire all six shots of a revolver with great suddenness, when one would probably be sufficient. But many things in the life of Herbert West were uncommon. It is, for instance, not often that a young physician leaving college is obliged to conceal the principles which guide his selection of a home and office. Yet that was the case with Herbert West. When he and I obtained our degrees at the medical school of Miskatonic University, and sought to relieve our poverty by setting up as general practitioners, we took great care not to say that we chose our house because it was fairly well isolated, and as near as possible to the potter's field. Reticence such as this is seldom without a cause, nor indeed was ours for our requirements were those resulting from a life-work distinctly unpopular. Outwardly we were doctors only, but beneath the surface were aims of far greater and more terrible moment, for the essence of Herbert West's existence was a quest amid black and forbidden realms of the unknown, in which he hoped to uncover the secret of life and restore to perpetual animation the graveyard's cold clay. Such a quest demands strange materials, among them fresh human bodies, and in order to keep supplied with these indispensable things, one must live quietly and not far from a place of informal interment. West and I had met in college, and I had been the only one to sympathize with his hideous experiments. Gradually I had come to be his inseparable assistant, and now that we were out of college we had to keep together. It was not easy to find a good opening for two doctors in company, but finally the influence of the university secured us a practice in Bolton, a factory town near Arkham, the seat of the college. The Bolton worsted mills are the largest in the Miskatonic Valley, and their polyglot employees are never popular as patients with the local physicians. We chose our house with the greatest care, seizing at last on a rather run-down cottage near the end of Pond Street, five numbers from the closest neighbor, and separated from the local potter's field by only a stretch of meadow land bisected by a narrow neck of the rather dense forest which lies to the north. The distance was greater than we wished, but we could get no nearer house without going on the other side of the field, wholly out of the factory district. We were not much displeased, however, since there were no people between us and our sinister source of supplies. The walk was a trifle long, but we could haul our silent specimens undisturbed. Our practice was surprisingly large from the very first, large enough to please most young doctors, and large enough to prove a bore and a burden to students whose real interest lay elsewhere. The mill hands were of somewhat turbulent inclinations and besides their many natural needs, their frequent clashes and stabbing affrays gave us plenty to do. But what actually absorbed our minds was the secret laboratory we had fitted up in the cellar, the laboratory with the long table under the electric lights, where, in the small hours of the morning, we often injected West's various solutions into the veins of the things we dragged from the potter's field. West was experimenting madly to find something which would start man's vital motions anew after they had been stopped by the thing we call death, but had encountered the most ghastly obstacles. The solution had to be differently compounded for different types. What would serve for guinea pigs would not serve for human beings and different human specimens required large modifications. 
the bodies had to be exceedingly fresh, or the slight decomposition of brain tissue would render perfect reanimation impossible. Indeed, the greatest problem was to get them fresh enough. West had had horrible experiences during his secret college researches with corpses of doubtful vintage. The results of partial or imperfect animation were much more hideous than were the total failures, and we both held fearsome recollections of such things. Ever since our first demoniac session in a deserted farmhouse on Meadow Hill in Arkham, we had felt a brooding menace, and West, though a calm, blonde, blue-eyed scientific automation in most respects, often confessed to a shuddering sensation of stealthy pursuit. He half felt that he was followed, a psychological delusion of shaken nerves, enhanced by the undeniably disturbing fact that at least one of our reanimated specimens was still alive, a frightful carnivorous thing in a padded cell at Sefton. Then there was another, our first, whose exact fate we had never learned. We had fair luck with specimens in Bolton, much better than in Arkham. We had not been settled a week before we got an accident victim on the very night of burial, and made it open its eyes with an amazingly rational expression before the solution failed. It had lost an arm. If it had been a perfect body, we might have succeeded better. Between then and the next January, we secured three more. One total failure, one case of marked muscular motion, and one rather shivery thing. It rose of itself and uttered a sound. Then came a period when luck was poor, interments fell off, and those that did occur were of specimens either too diseased or too maimed for use. We kept track of all the deaths and their circumstances with systematic care. One March night, however, we unexpectedly obtained a specimen which did not come from the potter's field. In Bolton the prevailing spirit of Puritanism had outlawed the sport of boxing, with the usual result. Surreptitious and ill-conducted bouts among the mill workers were common and occasionally professional talent of low grade was imported. This late winter night there had been such a match, evidently with disastrous results, since two timorous Poles had come to us with incoherently whispered entreaties to attend to a very secret and desperate case. We followed them to an abandoned barn, where the remnants of a crowd of frightened foreigners were watching a silent black form on the floor. The match had been between Kid O'Brien, a lubberly and now quaking youth with the most un-Hiberian hooked nose, and Buck Robinson. The Harlem smoke, the negro, had been knocked out. And a moment's examination showed us that he would permanently remain so. He was a loathsome, gorilla-like thing, with abnormally long arms which I could not help calling forelegs, and a face that conjured up thoughts of unspeakable Congo secrets and tom-tom poundings under an eerie moon. The body must have looked even worse in life, but the world holds many ugly things. Fear was upon the whole pitiful crowd, for they did not know what the law would expect of them if the affair were not hushed up, and they were grateful when West, in spite of my involuntary shudders, offered to get rid of the thing quietly, for a purpose I knew too well. There was bright moonlight over the snowless landscape, but we dressed the thing and carried it home between us through the deserted streets and meadows as we had carried a similar thing one horrible night in Arkham. We approached the house from the field in the rear, 
took the specimen in the back door and down the cellar stairs, and prepared it for the usual experiment. Our fear of the police was absurdly great, though we had timed our trip to avoid the solitary patrolman of that section. The result was wearily anticlimactic. Ghastly as our prize appeared, it was wholly unresponsive to every solution we injected in its black arm, solutions prepared from experience with white specimens only. So as the hour grew dangerously near to dawn, we did as we had done with the others, dragged the thing across the meadows to the neck of the woods near the potter's field, and buried it there in the best sort of grave the frozen ground would furnish. The grave was not very deep, but fully as good as that of the previous specimen, the thing which had risen of itself and uttered a sound. In the light of our dark lanterns we carefully covered it with leaves and dead vines, fairly certain that the police would never find it in a forest so dim and dense. The next day I was increasingly apprehensive about the police, for a patient brought rumours of a suspected fight and death. West had still another source of worry, for he had been called in the afternoon to a case which ended very threateningly. An Italian woman had become hysterical over her missing child, a lad of five who had strayed off early in the morning and failed to appear for dinner, and had developed symptoms highly alarming in view of an always weak heart. It was a very foolish hysteria, for the boy had often run away before, but Italian peasants are exceedingly superstitious, and this woman seemed as much harassed by omens as by facts. About seven o'clock in the evening she had died, and her frightful husband had made a frightful scene in his efforts to kill West, whom he wildly blamed for not saving her life. Friends had held him when he drew a stiletto, but West departed amidst his inhuman shrieks, curses, and oaths of vengeance. In his latest affliction the fellow seemed to have forgotten his child, who was still missing as the night advanced. There was some talk of searching the woods, but most of the family's friends were busy with the dead woman and the screaming man. Altogether, the nervous strain upon West must have been tremendous. Thoughts of the police and of the mad Italian both weighed heavily. We retired about eleven, but I did not sleep well. Bolton had a surprisingly good police force for so small a town, and I could not help fearing the mess which would ensue if the affair of the night before were ever tracked down. It might mean the end of all our local work, and perhaps prison for both West and me. I did not like those rumours of a fight which were floating about. After the clock had struck three, the moon shone in my eyes, but I turned over without rising to pull down the shade. Then came the steady rattling at the back door. I lay still and somewhat dazed, but before long heard West's rap on my door. He was clad in dressing gown and slippers, and had in his hands a revolver and an electric flashlight. From the revolver, I knew that he was thinking more of the crazed Italian than of the police. We'd better both go, he whispered. It wouldn't do not to answer it anyway, and it may be a patient. It would be like one of those fools to try the back door. So we both went down the stairs on tiptoe, with a fear partly justified and partly that which comes only from the soul of the weird small hours. The rattling continued, growing somewhat louder. When we reached the door, I cautiously unbolted it and threw it open, 
and as the moon streamed revealingly down on the form silhouetted there, West did a peculiar thing. Despite the obvious danger of attracting notice and bringing down on our heads the dreaded police investigation, a thing which, after all, was mercifully averted by the relative isolation of our cottage, my friend suddenly, excitedly, and unnecessarily emptied all six chambers of his revolver into the nocturnal visitor. For that visitor was neither Italian nor policeman. Looming hideously against the spectral moon was a gigantic misshapen thing not to be imagined save in nightmares, a glassy-eyed, ink-black apparition nearly on all fours, covered with bits of mould leaves and vines foul with caked blood and having between its glistening teeth a snow-white terrible cylindrical object terminating in a tiny hand 